Hey, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, today, I wanted to talk to you about the um, the Ten Commandments and um, what Jesus had to say about them. And um, you know, they get talked a lot about, but I don't know if they're fully understood. I, I don't really think they are. Um, they've become more of a, a cultural symbol than you know something that we should be really paying attention to. So I wanted to dig into that a little bit today, and, and um, these can be found in Exodus chapter 20, uh, verse 2 through 17, and um, I will just get right into reading them. So um, verse 3 starts with, do not have any other gods besides me. Do not make an idol for yourself, whether in the shape of anything in the heavens above or on the earth below, or in the waters underneath. You must not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children of the Father's sin to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing faithful love to a thousand generations to those who love me and keep my commands. So... This, you know, seems maybe a little harsh, but God is not going to share um, worship that is due him to something that he created, a um, lifeless object that isn't worthy of anything. And, you know, people choose to worship that instead of God who created them. Um you know, and, and besides that, what good is a powerless created object? I mean, God knows that thing's not going to do any good for you. He doesn't want to see you, you know, praying and bowing down to a worthless object that is doing absolutely nothing for you when he can do that, and yet you won't seek him. You know, and idols, it's kind of changed meaning over a little bit. Um... Not really just the object, but in, in that day, there, there was literal idols of wood, stone, metal. Um, they could be forged into what any anybody wanted, you know, the golden calf, you know, um, statues, you know, we read about and all throughout the Old Testament, the Asherah poles, um, statues in the high places, just temples to false, you know, pagan gods and, and things like that. And, you know, it's kind of ironic, I think, um, you know, for God is creator of all. He created us. And our response is we worship him. He is supremely above us in every way imaginable. You know, he, he is God. He is the creator. And then, then you got these idols that people make with their own hands, their own ideas. They make these, you know, we, we are created in God's image and then people turn around and they create these idols in their own image. They make, make a God into what they want. And it's, it's ironic, these idols that they've created should, should really be worshiping the people. As, as their creator, and, and I think really that's the point of it. You know, subtly, that's what's really going on, is people are creating these false gods in, in their own image because these false gods really are worshiping them, their creator. It's, it's just totally the opposite of what God did and designed. And, you know, that's, that's the devil and his schemes, is he does... He takes what God does and does the opposite. That's his rebellion. You know, he takes what God does, disguises it, and, and does it the opposite way, and, and people just follow right in line. Um, I mean, these, these idols, people don't, don't understand. He, how can this idol be a god? You made it with your own hands. You know, you, you, gave, it, you, you gave it its characteristics. You told it what it can do and what it can't do. You know, and this is the opposite. As a follower of Christ, we are being made into his image. 
not the not the idol being made into our image. It's you know this blows me away how people can consider that a god. And, and today it's not so much idols of wood and stone. Today it's more like idols of ideas. Um, and th those idols are still out there. I mean, you can go to a salon and there's statues of Buddha all over the place, or, or um, at least the ones I've seen, um, you know, and things like that. But for the most part, you know, um, idols are, are ideas. Idols are, especially in this day and age, are you, mostly ourselves. People have made themselves into an idol. I mean, the atheist says there is no God, but they're they're fooling themselves. They're lying to themselves. Really, what they're saying is, I am God. I, you know, I'm the master of my own destiny. I am, you know, responsible for everything in my life. It's all it all comes from me. And so they've made themselves into an idol, which is why they reject God, because then that means they have to give up being God, or their own God. And so they reject him. You know, and Jesus says about this command, um, you know, he, he expands on it a little bit. In Matthew twenty two thirty seven. 37, the Pharisees were trying to question him. They're always trying to trap him. You know, the religious leaders of the day, they, they always think they're smarter than he is. Just completely unaware that the author of the Ten Commandments is standing right in front of them and they're trying to trick him. You know, they're trying to trip him up to get him to say something that they could use against him. And uh, Jesus says in Matthew twenty two thirty seven, he said to him, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. So he, he expanded on that a little bit. He actually increased it, gave it a higher standard. And he says, this is the greatest and most important command. Then he says, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and prophets depend on these two commands. So, you know, what he's saying, you obey these two commands, you obey everything. There's nothing that can be left out. All other commands all come back to this. Are you loving God? Are you loving others? You know, you there's something like 623 Levitical commands, I believe it is, or pretty close, not to mention all the man-made religion laws, regulations, and ways to make them feel better about themselves that religious leaders added to the law of God. And Jesus is saying, do these two things and you obeyed it all. That, that's it. It's as simple as that. But uh, continuing on now, um, down in verse 7, it says, Do not misuse the name of the Lord your God, because the Lord will not leave anyone unpunished who misuses his name. Now, there's, there's a lot of misconception about this command. Many people believe this simply means... Um, don't say his name in vain, you know, don't, don't use his name as a cuss word. And, um, and it certainly does mean that. that. That is certainly a despicable thing to do, to use the name of God as a cuss word. But that's actually not what he is saying here. What he's saying is to be a false representative of Christ. Um, you know, for, for, for our day, just to put it in our context... It's to say, I'm a Christian, I follow the Lord, and, and yet you live like the devil. You know, you're a Christian Monday through Saturday. I mean, you're a Christian on Sunday, but then Monday through Saturday, you're an atheist. Or at least you live like it and act like it. Um, you, you live as one of God's enemies. You, you, carry, you carry his name, you're his representative, and you're just bringing dishonor to his name. Just by the, your choices, the way you live, you reject, you know, you live in rebellion, you reject his commands, you know, you follow after the ways of the world, and, but, but I'm a Christian, you know, you wear, you wear a cross necklace, you have a t-shirt or a bumper sticker on your car, cutting people off, 
bobbing and weaving in, in and out of lanes, just flipping people off, but I'm a Christian. You know, you, you bring dishonor to the name of God. People, people see that, and they're like, oh, there goes one of those Christians again, you know, Glad I'm not a Christian. I don't want to be like that. I mean, there's nobody who can spot a fake quicker than the world. It, as mind-boggling as that is, they, they, they know who the fakes are. Because they'll look at you and be like, you're no different than I am. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in any of that stuff. And here you are saying you're a Christian, you got that cross necklace, you got that t-shirt, you got that bumper sticker, you are no different than I am. You live just as rebellious and vulgar as I do. And, you know, and that, that's not to say we don't make mistakes. This isn't about not making mistakes and being perfect. This is about your life. What does your life represent? You know, are you headed in the direction of Christ? Are you following him and where he's going? You stumble along the way, but are you following him? In the, You know, what's the direction of your life? Or do you just have nothing to do with him whatsoever, other than the superficial? That's what the, this command is about. This is just like the other commands. It's, it's not about super, the superficial appearance. It's about what's going on in your heart. And now... Um, the next one, verse 8, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. You are to labor six days and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You must not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slaves, your livestock or the foreigner who is within your gate. You know, and again, people get caught up in this and, and, and make it about religion. And, and also, I should note, the word, the, the word male and female slave here. This is not what, again, we, we look at this, we filter these things through an American cultural lens. And this is not, these slaves are not slaves that Israel went to a foreign nation, captured people and took them home. These are like what, um, I guess a, a better name or more understandable name would be like indentured servant. They're paying off, they, they can't pay off a debt, so they pay off a debt by going to work for the family. Or they, um, you know, they'll give the, their children to go work for this family to pay off a debt. And that's why people criticize the Bible saying, oh, God doesn't condemn slavery, and it's not the same type of slavery for one. And two, there's very specific commands on how to treat these people. You know, these aren't people you whip the back of every day or you just kill them at will. No, there's laws governing how you treat your servants. And and I got sidetracked a little bit here. That, that's a whole nother sermon, but people try to use this and say, ah, see, there's the word slave. The Bible's fake. And they, they have no idea what they're talking about. But getting back to um, the Sabbath, um... You know, again, uh, back to verse 11. For the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and everything in them in six days. Then he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and declared it holy. And and people fight over this command all the time. You know, they, they use it as a religious burden. They try to, you know, they even use it as a measuring stick. Like, well, my church is holier than your church because, you know, we have church on Saturday and that's the true Sabbath. And just whatever, man, you know, I'll, I'll get you a medal when, you know, you can pin it on your chest when, when I get a chance. But that's, you know, that's, that's not what God intended for it at all. And, and Jesus confronted the religious leaders of um, his day for the same reason. The, the, you know, and this, this was also a biggest contention that the religious leaders had with Jesus, constantly confronting him about it. You know, Jesus says in Mark um, chapter 2, verse 27 and 28, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And, you know, that really sent the, lead, the religious leaders doing backflips of anger and, and whatnot. But, you know, this was, this was never meant to be a burden to people. 
or to use it as a weapon against people. Um, you know, when, when, when Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath right in front of their eyes, all they can do is complain about it. Oh my gosh, he healed a man on the Sabbath. He worked. Jesus is saying, I am the Sabbath. And it just went right over their head. It was just so up this, I mean, this miracle of God. And ironically, these same people say, show us a sign and then we'll believe. Well, you just had a, the guy healed right in front of you, you know, and you complained about it. What other sign do you want? You know, it's just, it's a day, it's a simple day of rest to refocus your mind on Christ. That was the whole intent of the Sabbath. Um, so, you know, continuing on at verse 12. Um, honor your mother and your father so that you may have long life in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And, you know, this is the first command that actually has that has a promise attached to it. And, um, you know, a lot of people have brought up how do I, you know, the the children, you know, they're followers of Christ and, and they want to they want to obey and they, they genuinely want to do the right thing. And they're like, you know, my 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 father or my mother or both they're they're the devil incarnate how do i honor them you know and i remember my pastor talking about this and he said you know you you honor your parents by living a godly and upright life it can be as simple as that this is not a command that you do everything your parents tell you at all times even as an adult i mean you have people in their 20s and they're still being controlled by their parents because their parents throw this in the fa their kid's face. Oh, honor your mother and father. You got to do what I say. And that's not what this is saying at all. And I mean, each one of these individual commandments could be a sermon by themselves. But this is, you know, you bring honor to your parents by living a godly and upright life. You know, like... I mean, I remember is is my own son, and you know he has his struggles. And just the other day at the gas station, you know my my wife likes to let him. He likes to feel like a big boy. You know he can go into the store with a little bit of money in his hand, and he'll buy himself a donut or something. And so, you know, my wife will wait in the car in the parking lot. She'll give him a couple bucks, and he'll run in the store and buy a donut. And you know he's all proud of himself, and you know it's it's adorable, <laughs> but. You know, the, he goes in, and there's another lady there getting donuts, and he got the last bag for the donut, so she was just going to grab a wrapper. And, you know, my son, he's, he's just got such a big heart for, for others. And he said, hey, you know, you can't, we need to get you a bag. And the lady said, well, we're out of bags, so I'll just use this. And Isaac says, oh, hold on a minute. And he runs up to the counter. He tells the person, hey, we need more donut bags. She doesn't have a donut bag. And so the person says, oh, you know, they go back, they get her, and they bring the woman a bag. And um, she goes outside and tells my wife, she's like, you know, you that's a good boy. You raised your boy right. And there he goes, honoring his mother and father. You know, just something simple like that. And um, so now verses 13 through 17, we get more into the more familiar commands. Um, they're pretty self-explanatory. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female slaves. Again, what I was talking about earlier his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. I mean, these are self-explanatory. But again, uh, Jesus always digs deeper. He, he always goes deeper than just a surface reading. He goes into the heart. Where's your heart with this? He, you know, he's not looking for surface obedience. He's looking what's in your heart. And... Um, so I'll go over to uh, skip over to Matthew five twenty one, and Jesus says, "You've heard it was said to our ancestors, do not murder. And whoever murders will be subject to judgment." You know, Ten Commandments. But I tell you, you know, Jesus always always ups the ante. People say, "Well, Jesus did away with the law." I was like, "No, not really. He he expanded on it." 
But I tell you, everyone who is angry with his brother it will be subject to judgment. And um, some versions say hatred. And then this is what it really means is, you know, you're not angry at him because he got the light slice of pizza. You, you got genuine hat hatred for somebody in your heart. You, you've already committed murder, you know, in the eyes of God. That's what he's saying here. It's you've murdered in your heart. It's all about what is in your heart. That's what God is looking at. You know, same thing, uh, Matthew 5, 27. You have heard it was said, do not commit adultery. You know, we're straight from the Ten Commandments. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with him in his heart. And, and ladies, that goes for you too. Looking at that man... You know, lusting after him, somebody else's husband. It, it's the same thing. Um, it's what's in your heart that what is the concern here. The concern is not that you superficially obeyed. The concern is if it's in your heart, you know, if you're obeying in your heart, you'll, um, you'll obey the commandment physically. But if you're disobeying in your heart, eventually you're going to disobey physically. You know, if you're lusting after somebody unchecked, unchallenged, you just continuously lust after that person, at some point, it's going to happen. If it doesn't happen with the first person, it'll happen with the second. I mean, a lustful person rarely just lusts lust after one. It's going to be more and more and more. And it's, 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 it's a hard issue. It's going to, you know, it's, it's not you made a one-time mistake. It was probably in your heart to begin with. And um, that's, that's what Jesus is trying to get at. And, you know, the final command is all about envy. Your, neighbor, your neighbor's house, the wife, you know, his property, his you know, livestock. You know, I mean, it's, it's a little bit different. You know, we have so much more than what, what, what they had back then. You know, if this command was written today, it'd be like, you know, his house, his family, what school he goes to, what city he lives in, what cell phone he has, you know, all his electronic devices, what kind of car he drives, you know. It's, people spend so much time, you know, envying and lusting after what other people have, they, they miss what God is doing in their life. You know, they're, they're, they're so worried about what, what everybody else has. God had probably had it for them too. They just, they missed it because they were chasing after what somebody else had instead of chasing after God. You know, uh, James, James puts it this way in um, chapter, James chapter 3, verse 14 through 16. He says, but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, and he says that um, mockingly or sarcastically, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, and, and here it is, demonic. For what you have envy and selfish ambition, for where you have envy and selfish ambition, you find disorder and every evil practice. And I mean, that's that's just being played out in front of our eyes. You know, people want what everybody else has, and they're willing to to commit whatever crime or whatever evil they need to do to get it, and they justify it by saying, "I was owed it." You know. Life owes me, so I have a right to go take it. And, you know, life doesn't owe you anything. And you've committed great evil to go do this. I mean, the envy started in your heart. You know, just like the other ones, it started in your heart. And it just didn't take long to reach the surface. And now that's just who you've become. You want what everybody else has. And it just, it's a spiral, it's a downward spiral straight to death and destruction. I mean, even if you do manage to steal from somebody and take, you know, you, you looted these grocery stores and 
you know, you stole an 80 inch plasma screen TV and well, somehow you think now you have justice because you have an 80 inch screen plasma TV. It's, you know, you're just envy, full of envy. You know, people spend a lot of time complaining about greed and corporate greed and my boss is greedy, my company's greedy, and, and maybe they are, but you're just as guilty for being envious. You know, envy is no less of a sin than greed. You know, people need to understand that. Instead, what, 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 you know, the counter to that is realizing, you know, a few things. First, you know, in relation to your job, promotion is from the Lord. And, and I personally learned this, you know, I guess you could say for lack of a better word, learned it the hard way. You know, watching person after person who was way less qualified for, the, for a job than I was get promoted. And it was a struggle. And I went to a Christian brother and I talked to him and I was just like, man, do you, I was just starting to really feel like something was going on. And I said, do you, do you think that with all this, I'm being rejected for like no good reason. Do you think it's God himself rejecting me? And being a loving Christian brother, he said one word, yes. <laughs> like what, what? You weren't supposed to say that. You're supposed to say something comforting. You know, it's like, no, the, the Lord is protecting you from something. We can't see it. We don't know what it is. But if he's shutting this door, he's protecting you from something. You know, promotion is from the Lord. He will promote you. If, if that's the calling that, that he's given you, if that's the position he's given you, he'll do it in his time. You know, I, I don't have the, the, the Bible verse on hand. I just I was thinking of King David. He you know, he was anointed king over Israel, and I might be off by a few years, but it what was it like somewhere 15, 20 years later that he actually sat on the throne? You know, promotion is from the Lord. He, he will put you on, you know, for lack of a better word, he will put you on the throne that you belong on, um, if you will, in his time. You know, you don't need to be envious of the people that got promoted ahead of you. They might be headed for a trap that God uh, mercifully and lovingly spared you from. And, and your gifts are from the Lord. All good things are from the Lord. Don't be envious of what he gave to somebody else. And, and I preached a, a message about this earlier, about the talents. You know, if you're the, if you're the, the, the two-bag person, don't be envious of the five-bag person. You know, God gave you the two, be faithful with the two. When you multiply that two, you know, now you got four. Be faithful with the four. Now you got eight, and so on and so on. Same with the, with the one bad guy. You know, he, he just threw it and buried it. He didn't want nothing to do with it. And, you know, be, be thankful. Count your blessings for what God has gave you. You know, don't be envious of what someone else has. And, you know, and I'm not talking about crime, where there's a literal crime when someone literally, you know, breaks into your house and steals, literally steals your stuff. You know, I'm not talking about crime that, that will just, you know, there's no justice there. That's not what I'm saying. But make sure we're talking about real crime and not assumed crime. What I mean by that is, that person's rich they must be a criminal they stole it it's like that person's been working hard their whole life you don't have a right to come in and say well they got there because they committed a crime that's envy you know your heart's exposed not theirs so you know conclusion is is and it is the whole ten commandments trust in him trust his timing trust his plan he will take care of you he will not leave you or forsake you. You know, we miss our blessings because we're too busy chasing someone else's. Too busy taking care of self when Jesus says others. The two greatest commandments. Number one, love the Lord thy God with all you got. And number two, love others. Nothing in there about self. You do those two things, everything else will be taken care of. You know, we're, we're too busy building our own kingdoms instead of the kingdom of God. And, you know, this is the key, not that blessing is our, our pursuit, but this is the key to blessing. 
Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. All these things that you're envious of somebody of that somebody else has would have been yours if you had just sought the kingdom of God first. Love God, love others. Do those two things, and these you know, these things will be taken care of. You'll be provided for. The things that God has promised you, promised you, you know, not someone else, what God has promised you and has for you, his plan, his purpose. Everything that falls in line with that will be provided for you. You know, tragically, this does not mean that I'm not going to have, you know, a Ferrari out front because, you know, that's what I want. That's not what God's saying here, you know. To the guy that does have a Ferrari, high five, you know, that's awesome for you. I'm happy for you. But I'm not going to be envious of that. God has something else for me. And I praise God every day for what he has given me. And you just need to trust him. He's going to give you what you need. He knows you. He created you. And, and, and I'm wrapping up here. But he's going to give you what you need. And all the joy in the world that, that is found in him, this other stuff that you're being envious of can't compare to. It's, it's, it's not even close. So, all right, I'm wrapping up now. So, you know, I just really want us to get that into our hearts. And, you know, we would be all be so much better off. We'd get along better. Our relationships would go better. Um, we would trust, trust God and trust each other, too, so much more. All right, so love all of you. Uh, be blessed. In Jesus' name.